Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. Today's narrative delves into the haunting realm of a missing child, Oakley Carlson. This particular case has weighed heavily on me, not just as a storyteller, but as a parent. Every glimpse of Oakley's face echoes the image of my own daughter. While the emotional toll of covering this case scared me, it pales compared to the anguish felt by those who love her. You see, the nightmare of a missing child is a fear that should resonate with every parent. Unfortunately, reality reveals that shared DNA doesn't guarantee familial love. True family is often discovered beyond blood ties, whether in the realms of education, work, or the early stages of life, a second chance at belonging. Today, with a heavy heart, we delve into the disappearance of a very young soul, cherished by her foster parents, but seemingly neglected by her biological kin. As we approach what would have been Oakley Carlson's seventh birthday and mark the two-year anniversary of her disappearance, we embark on a journey to piece together the haunting puzzle of her case. The emotional toll is undeniable, but if I want to be an advocate, I have to be able to do it, even when it's difficult. While I typically remove myself from these cases or the scripts, it's impossible to do here. I urge you all to listen and help spread awareness for Oakley and other children in similar situations. I also want to express deep gratitude to Oakley's foster parents, Jamie Joe and Eric Hiles, the Light the Way Missing Persons Advocacy Project, Haley Gray at Haley Gray Research, and a big thank you to Jesse Hawk, our production assistant, for skillfully leading the way on this episode. Their support empowers me to share this heartbreaking episode. Okay, on to the show. Oakley Lynn Carlson was born on December 6, 2016, in Oakville, Washington. She was the second of three children Jordan Bowers and Andrew Carlson had together the first being a sister, not much older than Oakley, and the second, a brother three years younger than her. They also had step-siblings from their parents' previous relationships, including a son of Jordan, who was around four years older than Oakley, and often stayed with his father. The home life of Oakley and her siblings for those first few years was incredibly rocky and dangerous for a young, developing child. Andrew Carlson had previously been a peace officer, attending the basic academy for training in 2012, before becoming an official officer that same year. A peace officer is similar to a police officer, including having the power to make arrests and the authority to enforce laws. There are some differences between the roles, but for the sake of this case, they're not particularly relevant. Besides, this was not a long-lasting career for Andrew, as he found himself in hot water in early 2017, for making false or misleading statements, which lost him his peace officer certification, and with it, his job. A year and a half later, Andrew was also charged by the sheriff's office with malicious mischief in the third degree. Although it isn't clear exactly what Andrew damaged or how this charge is one levied against those who intentionally damaged another individual's property. Jordan Bowers was similarly unreliable, with numerous convictions for criminal acts in the decade leading up to Oakley's birth. These included disorderly conduct, drunk driving, hit and runs of both property and vehicles, fraud, and theft. Most relevantly, though, she was charged with possession and consumption of unspecified substances in 2008, something it seems was a constant presence in their lives, as both Jordan and Andrew frequently exposed their children to drug use. This ultimately resulted in the children being removed from their care for their own safety. This removal from the home, aged not even one year old, introduced Oakley to her real family. On September 22, 2017, Oakley went to live with Jamie Joe and Eric Hiles. Jamie Joe and Eric were a story of love at first sight as high school juniors, ones who knew from the get-go that they wanted a large family a basketball team's worth of them, in Jamie Joe's words. This dream, however, became further and further away for the pair as they encountered difficulties with infertility, leading to unsuccessful treatments and several miscarriages. 
Then, they decided to put things on hold until they had time to recover and decide what to do moving forward. In July 2017, Jamie Jo, a teacher, received a text from one of her former students. This student knew one of Oakley's grandparents and asked Jamie Jo if she and her husband would be willing to foster a seventh-month-old baby. They leaped at the opportunity, in part because they had been led to believe that fostering the child might lead to adoption. They brought Oakley home two months later, where she would stay for more than two years. In Oakley's eyes, Jamie Jo and Eric were her parents. She called them mom and dad, and she only knew Jordan and Andrew by their first names on supervised visits with the pair. The Hiles family instantly became hers and was the perfect place for a little girl like Oakley to grow up happy. We'll tell you a little about who this wonderful little girl was through the words of Jamie Jo on the website Justice for Oakley. Oakley was someone who did not know a stranger. She always had a smile on her face and was kind. She loved to make people laugh, so when she knew how to make you smile, she would always remember that and try to do it again. She liked to tell jokes and would often follow up a joke with Waka Waka, just like Fozzie Bear from The Muppets. For being only almost three years old, she was incredibly smart. She spoke in almost complete sentences, demonstrated empathy, and questioned things that did not make sense to her. Oakley loved to dance, and it was quite frequent that we would have dance parties in the living room for her to groove to. She admired my dance team and always asked me to play their songs from practice so she could dance like them. I bet you we have played Barbara Ann by the Beach Boys at least a thousand times. Oakley also loved to read and be read to. It was never just one book at bedtime, but at least four or sometimes five. It was not uncommon to find her asleep in her bed with books as well or all around her in the morning. Lastly, Oakley loved to show you that she loved you. I have countless photos of her hugging my family and friends, and she always made sure to tell you that she loved you. She loved to hug, snuggle, and just touch you. Many times we would be on the couch together and her little foot would be touching my side just because she wanted to be touching me. Her love radiated out of her, and she always let it show. Oakley was the biggest blessing to my husband, our family, and our friends. Many times, Eric and I would ask each other how we got so lucky with having her because she was so happy all the time, and she was just an all-around good kid. Her new parents so adored Oakley that it didn't even take a year for the Hiles to set in motion plans to adopt her. Although foster systems aimed to return children to their biological families as often as possible, it did not seem that Jordan and Andrew were making any improvements. In fact, they seemed to be doing worse. On July 30th, 2018, the same month the Hiles began to plan their adoption, Andrew was booked for assault for attacking Jordan. He was subsequently ordered by the court to undergo a domestic violence evaluation and complete a domestic violence treatment program upon his release. Clearly, their home wasn't a safe space for anyone, never mind a toddler with such a loving disposition. Life moved on as normally as possible for the Hiles and Oakley in their situation for the next few months. Supervised visits continued with Jordan and Andrew, which went smoothly until one specific visit on March 7, 2019. When Oakley came home from this two-hour-long visit, her diaper had not been changed, and her face had red marks that resembled scratch marks on her cheeks. Concerned, Jamie Jo asked the visit supervisor what had happened to the little girl, but the supervisor couldn't explain how the scratches were obtained. Unhappy with this turn of events, Jamie Jo emailed the DCYF, which is the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Family Services, and the caseworker assigned to Oakley. She included in this email a visit observation log regarding the day when Oakley gained the mysterious scratches and hadn't been cared for hygienically. The caseworker, Angela Freeze, ignored these concerns, responding to the email two days later to say, I'm on vacation next week. We can schedule the health and safety for the first week I'm back. Because, as we all know, vacation time takes precedence over the potential neglect or abuse of a toddler under your care. No cause for the red marks has ever been officially determined. What might not surprise you is that following this, Andrew Carlson had not been attending his domestic violence treatment group sessions. On May 13th, the treatment program wrote a letter to the DCYF notifying them that he had not attended since April 1st, and they had been forced to discharge him from the program. 
Because of this failure to comply with the conditions of his release following his assault on Jordan, the prosecuting attorney in the case asked the judge to find Andrew guilty and give him prison time. However, the charges instead ended up being dropped completely, so he faced little to no consequences for his violent actions. What should surprise, outrage, and upset you is that in July of 2019, the Hiles received a phone call informing them that Oakley was probably going to be returned to her biological parents, and soon. This was despite the Hiles' year-long preparations to adopt Oakley. Despite documented acts of domestic violence at the home of her biological parents and her biological father's adamant refusal to continue treatment. Despite the apparent neglect or even abuse Oakley suffered on even supervised visits. Despite the fact that there was absolutely no evidence either Jordan or Andrew was in a better place to care for any of their children than they had been two years prior when they had been taken into foster care. The Hiles were absolutely devastated when they were given this news, but had no choice but to comply, as visits between Oakley and her biological parents increased in frequency. In October, they reached out and scheduled a meeting to discuss Oakley's return with Angela Freeze and supervisor Catherine Eddy, citing all the previous issues, as well as commenting that neither Jordan nor Andrew was employed and therefore ably equipped to care for a number of children. They were harshly told that Oakley isn't your daughter, and being poor isn't a reason for someone to not have their children. Over the next few weeks, they continued to try to air their concerns about Oakley's safety, but it fell on unlistening ears. On October 19th, unsupervised visits started. The next week, Oakley came home and told her parents that she witnessed Jordan hit Andrew over a disagreement about a video he was letting Oakley watch. When Jamie Jo attempted to report this, Angela Freeze responded, quote, There were no concerns, and Oakley loved her mom and dad. Then, when they discovered overnight visits were due to begin, they tried once again to voice their fears. This time, specifically, the recent reports of domestic violence in the home and how quickly this process was moving. Oakley had gone from two years in a consistent, loving environment and was somehow expected to cope well with being returned to an unsafe home after only a few months of reintegration. It just didn't seem safe, sensible, or in the best interest of Oakley. This time, however, the email response from Freeze was like a bucket of ice water over the family. Not only did she wave away the Hiles' concerns, but she also informed them that Oakley was now due to be reunited with her biological parents on November 29th, just over three weeks from that date. When Eric emailed a question why this process had been apparently expedited so abruptly, he never received a response. The overnight visits to Jordan and Andrew's sprawling 300-acre property began on November 9th. Only 20 days later, Oakley was living there full-time. She had lived with the Hiles longer than she had ever lived with her biological parents, and now she was going to spend her third birthday in an environment that was openly hostile and barely familiar to her. Jamie, Joe, and Eric said they cried for hours on the day she left, experiencing a grief that felt like mourning the death of their little girl. Neither would enter Oakley's room in their home for half a year following her removal. Eric told the series, Never Seen Again, quote, I could feel my heart breaking. We knew this would be the last time we saw her, because we knew her parents wouldn't let her see us. And tragically, they were correct. Throughout the course of 2020, we barely know anything about Oakley's life or her whereabouts. The timeline for this year is more or less a question mark. We can attempt to glean some information from documentation regarding Jordan and Andrew, but what is there isn't promising. On July 27, 2020, Jordan and Andrew were involved in a custody hearing for another one of their children, not Oakley. However, many of the same concerns were addressed, particularly evidence of drug use in the home. According to reports, Jordan had been ordered to undergo a urine analysis test for drug use. Still, results were inconclusive, and she had been noted as saying to her social worker that she knew how to pass a UA. And in Andrew's case, they did not have access to any tests Andrew had submitted, if they had been done at all. In addition to the potential drug use, it was unclear whether Jordan or Andrew had ever completed any court-ordered services they had been assigned for treatment. 
Jordan wrote letters to the court on June 24, 2020, claiming they had completed their treatments, but the treatment agency specified had not provided evidence to confirm this. CPS also noted inconsistencies with the reporting of domestic violence within the home and zero attempts to attend treatment for these incidents. One final issue concerned one of their children who were disabled, as it didn't appear that Andrew and Jordan were meeting this child's needs, even when given additional support to attend hospital appointments. The next thing we know about Oakley is Christmas Day 2020. That's right, the Hiles last saw her on November 29, 2019. And the next thing we know for sure is over a year later. On December 25, 2020, Oakley's grandparents, Fred and Kate Carlson, hosted the family at their home. Kate later told police that Oakley didn't look well, saying the little girl was uncharacteristically pale, had scratches or sores on her face, and her eyes had big dark circles under them. Various news outlets incorrectly reported that Kate had called CPS over her granddaughter's condition, but this never occurred. Though Jamie Jo later begged her to report what she had seen, Kate refused because she feared how Andrew and Jordan would react. According to some sources, Andrew and Jordan cut contact with Oakley's grandparents following this, so it's possible one or both of them voiced concern about the little girl to somebody. When a friend of Kate Carlson showed Jamie Jo a photo of Oakley that seemed to show the girl with a black eye, she tried to contact the DCYF to get her help. In this call, she also mentioned that rumors were circulating that Andrew had been fired from his job due to drug use. She was reprimanded by intake worker Morgan Artis, who assumed her information was inaccurate due to not being a first-hand account and warned her against making false reports. He said this to Jamie Jo, a teacher who was a mandated reporter for anything that might signify child abuse or neglect in her students. Why should it matter that she didn't teach this child that might be in danger? And something she said struck a chord. The day after Jamie Joe's report, January 27th, a DCYF case was opened. A CPS caseworker attended the home to check on the children, and another such visit occurred on February 10th. February 10th, 2021, is the last known credible sighting of four-year-old Oakley Lynn Carlson. Jamie Jo received a call from the DCYF in late March asking if she had seen Oakley and her sister. There was no other context for this question, and Jamie Jo sadly informed them that she had no involvement with the family whatsoever. DCYF then closed the case file on Oakley without physically laying eyes on her for over a month. Fast forward over half a year, and on November 6, Andrew called dispatch, recording that their home was on fire. Strangely, he made the call at 4.54 p.m., even though the fire had occurred at 10 a.m., seven hours earlier. He claimed that his five-year-old daughter, Oakley, had set the couch on fire using a cigarette lighter, but he had managed to put out the fire by himself. So, no response was needed from the fire service. He just wanted the report on record for insurance purposes. However, that doesn't necessarily align with the home state following this incident. A GoFundMe was set up, clarifying that the entire upstairs portion of their home had been destroyed in the fire. Quote, After evacuating their three children and puppy who were home, Jordan and Andrew fought the fire themselves for hours. The house was completely dark with smoke, and neither of them could locate their cell phones to call for help, and there were no close neighbors, so they grabbed hoses and attempted to save their home. It went on to say that while nobody was injured, they needed money to replace belongings and restore the home. Fire investigators also had an issue with this part of the tale. It was clear that the fire had originated from the microwave on the kitchen counter, not the couch, as Andrew had asserted. Even though the home was partially destroyed, the family continued living in the fire-ravaged building for some time. When Jamie Jo Hiles attempted to report the children's conditions to CPS, she was ignored. Oakley's elementary school principal, Jessica Swift, came to the home to donate supplies to the family later that week. She stayed there for around 45 minutes and didn't see Oakley once. Realizing she hadn't seen Oakley in school for quite some time, Jessica asked after the little girl. Jordan and Andrew said she was in timeout and avoided any more questioning. Jessica brought more supplies over a few days later, and though this was a short visit of only around five minutes, she saw all three of the other children in the home. But there was still no sign of Oakley. 
After discussing the family with other teachers at her school, they agreed that something wasn't quite right. Jessica took it upon herself to investigate further, gently. Jessica's daughter was around the same age as Oakley's older sister, who was six by this time. She invited Oakley's sister to stay over on a play date with her daughter and casually brought up Oakley to see how the young girl would react. When Jessica asked after her younger sister, though, she wasn't expecting the girl to reply. Quote, there is no Oakley. Then curl into a ball on the couch and begin shaking. Shaken by this haunting response, Jessica tried to reassure the girl and left the matter alone until the next morning, when Oakley's sister told her that Oakley had gone back to living with her foster parents because she was so bad. We know this wasn't true, and Jessica found this out quickly. She called the sheriff who told her Oakley had not been placed back into foster care. Now worried for Oakley and her sister, she called Jordan to ask if her daughter could stay over for another night. She said yes, and Jessica took both girls to school that morning. As soon as the day started, Jessica called for a welfare check on Oakley, giving them all of the information she had about her former student. It was Oakley's fifth birthday when officers initiated a welfare check for her on December 6, 2021. The family were now staying in a hotel, and when the officers interviewed Jordan and Andrew, Oakley was not in the room, nor was there any sign of her. When they asked her where she was, Jordan had a truly chilling answer. Oakley is with her mom. Confused, the officer asked for confirmation that Jordan was, in fact, Oakley's mom. Jordan said, yes. Now even more confused, he asked again about Oakley. Jordan then turned to look at someone else in the room and said, Oakley is at your mom and dad's, presumably to Andrew. When the officer called him to the door and asked the same question, he first refused to respond. Then he vaguely said that Oakley was with his parents, but he didn't know their phone number to contact them. He also claimed that he didn't know his father's address, but eventually gave up this information. Oakley's grandfather, of course, had no idea where she was. Remember, he and his wife hadn't seen their granddaughter in almost a year since the previous Christmas, when she was pale and withdrawn and had sores on her face. Officers checked their home just in case, but soon verified that she was not there. After verifying that Oakley had not been returned to foster care, they returned to the hotel. This time, the officers separated Andrew and Jordan. Andrew didn't seem to care that his daughter wasn't where he had said she would be, and acted as if he already knew the information that was being given to him. Jordan, however, responded explosively, yelling that she wouldn't answer any questions about Oakley and stormed back into the hotel room. Following this, the officers left. In quick succession, Jordan or Andrew factory reset their phone, left the hotel with their youngest child, and returned to their fire-damaged home. Police followed, and Jordan was swiftly arrested for allegedly obstructing a police officer. Jordan was booked into Grays Harbor County Jail and a detective interviewed Andrew. The detective was unnerved by the statements Andrew made. Reportedly, what he said alluded to Oakley being dead and not coming back for a reunion. As a result, Andrew was also booked into jail, and both he and Jordan were held for obstruction of law enforcement, as well as suspicion of first-degree manslaughter. Immediately, a search began for any sign of Oakley, The family home contained toys and clothes for all the other children, but nothing belonging to Oakley. Blood spatter was found on the blinds near the front door, on the front door itself, and there was a handprint on the wall of the hallway. It isn't clear whether the blood or handprint were identified as being related to Oakley's disappearance. Oakley's siblings were interviewed about their sister. The six-year-old girl first said that she did not have a sister, but later admitted Oakley was her sister. She had just not seen her in a long time. With more gentle questioning, the girl said that Jordan had told her not to talk about Oakley, and she believed that she had gone out into the woods and had been eaten by wolves. 
When asked if her younger sister was hurt, she only responded by starting to cry. Their younger brother was only two at this time, but told law enforcement that his mother beat Oakley with a belt and would lock her in a closet, maybe one under the stairs. He also admitted that he had worried his sister was going to starve, and he believed that when the fire had happened, everyone got out okay, except Oakley. The same day the investigation began, Jamie Jo Hiles was asked if she could take Oakley's sister and her little brother for an emergency foster placement, as they believed Oakley was being held by a family member or otherwise missing but safe, she and Eric agreed immediately. However, when they discovered Andrew and Jordan had been charged with manslaughter, the pain and grief they felt made it too difficult to take in Oakley's brother, fearing they could not care for him well in this state. As a result, both siblings were taken into a different foster home, while their older brother went to stay with his biological father. On December 7th, a combined force, including the sheriff's office, FBI, and state patrol, began an extensive ground search for Oakley across the 300-acre property. When they did not find her, the search was widened to surrounding areas, and divers and aircraft were brought in. There was no evidence she had been in the woods, and given Oakley hadn't been seen for almost a year, I suppose that wasn't surprising. The investigation also considered whether she had been trafficked or was being held or hidden by a friend or relative, but there was no evidence to suggest this either. Another awful revelation came when the sister's foster parents asked law enforcement about a medication that was prescribed to the six-year-old. This was how officials learned that Jordan and Andrew had not been giving their daughter her life-saving medication for 15 months. Without the medication, she was at severe risk of impairment and eventually death if left too long. This led to investigators charging Jordan and Andrew with abandonment of a dependent and gave them further scope for the investigation, as well as a reason to hold them in custody for longer. Under the scope of the DCYF's investigation into child neglect, hair follicle samples were taken from Oakley's two young siblings for testing. Results revealed that substantial amounts of methamphetamine had been found in the samples which meant the children had been exposed to the drug within the last three months. Around this time, the sheriff's department posted to Facebook saying, Investigators believe the disappearance is criminal in nature and will continue the search for Oakley Carlson. The parents claim the last time they saw Oakley alive was November 30, 2021. The parents have not indicated that Oakley is in the care of an adult and cannot account for her whereabouts or condition. It was not until later that they could determine she had not been seen since the CPS visit on February 10th. Oakley had been missing 299 days earlier than they had initially believed. Despite the thoroughness of the search and investigation into Oakley's disappearance, months began to pass, with no further progress being made in the case. Her grandparents were cooperating with police, but asked for privacy from the media. The same could not be said for Oakley's biological parents, however. In late December, Jordan and Andrew began to appear in court for the charges regarding not providing medication to their older daughter. Though this hearing did not directly have anything to do with Oakley, her disappearance and the parents' disinterest were used by the prosecution as proof of their character, or lack thereof. Charges were added to this in January 2022, and the prosecutor included two counts of endangerment with a controlled substance to the cases based on the hair samples of their two young children. Every time either parent made a court appearance, demonstrators called Oakley's Angels showed up. They weren't going to let Oakley slide under the radar, and they weren't going to let Andrew and Jordan forget it. At one protest in particular, on January 29th, Jordan's oldest son was in attendance. The nine-year-old reportedly told the Chronicle, I want some justice. I want my mom to tell us where she is finally. Jamie Jo began to advocate for the children, filing a complaint on behalf of Oakley and her siblings to the Office of Family and Children's Ombuds in February 2022. Soon after, Light the Way Missing Persons Advocacy Project began a weekly campaign to contact a number of law officials to request an immediate outside agency review of Oakley's DCYF case. It seems truly senseless that Oakley had so many people concerned and looking out for her. However, she was still returned to an abusive environment and queries about her well-being and whereabouts were flat-out ignored. Later that summer, on July 16th, the Hiles and the Light the Way Missing Persons Advocacy Group posted Paint the Night Pink, an auction and dinner for Oakley. Together, their efforts raised almost $50,000 for her reward fund. 
Rewinding a few months that March, Andrew pleaded guilty to the charges of endangerment with a controlled substance. He was sentenced to the maximum sentence of 12 months in prison. This came with restrictions for firearm possession, contact with the children, and the need to undergo treatment for chemical dependency. He was not permitted to possess or use any controlled substances. In April, Jordan pleaded guilty to the same charges, but one count of abandonment was dropped as part of her plea deal. However, she was given a longer sentence of 20 months in prison due to her criminal history. She was also restricted from having contact with anyone under the age of 18. During her sentencing, Judge Catherine Svoboda said, It is a parent's job to protect your children, and Jordan failed to do that. Both Andrew and Jordan would have any contact with their biological children decided upon in dependency court. If you're good with dates and how sentencing time works with time served, you might have already seen this coming. But Andrew Carlson was released from Gray Harbor County Jail for the child endangerment charges on August 3, 2022. He did not show up for his chemical dependency review hearing on September 12th, and the judge issued a bench warrant. However, Andrew did make it to a criminal hearing later in the day, which quashed this warrant. Following this, he attended several court hearings via Zoom and in person to review his adherence to the terms of his release. Andrew's compliance throughout this time was found to be shaky, but he was not penalized for this, though he remains to be monitored to this day. From May 2022 onwards, there were further pushes for a review of how the DCYF had handled Oakley's case. Jamie Jo specifically provided a timeline of issues and failures she had encountered while dealing with Angela Fries and her supervisor, Catherine Eddy. However, on September 9th, the OFCO investigation report regarding Oakley Carlson was released, clearing DCYF of any wrongdoing in the case. They said, quote, We found that the department's actions and conduct in this case were consistent with laws, policy, and court orders. We found that the department's actions and conduct in this case were consistent with laws, policies, and court orders. Our investigation, however, identified opportunities to improve services to families, specifically to preserve and strengthen the parent-child bond when a child is removed from the home. In simpler terms, as put by NW News, one of the DCYF's strategic priorities is to reduce the number of children and youth in out-of-home care by half. When safely possible, the agency prioritizes reuniting children with their biological parents. And while this is an admirable aim on paper, I'm inclined to agree with Jamie Jo's response to this report. She shared her concerns that the DCYF were so focused on reunification that they lost sight of their core mission. Hopefully, DCYF can reform and really focus on what they are meant to do, and that's, you know, protecting children. Unfortunately, any potential progress that may be made is too little, way too late for Oakley Carlson. The investigation into Oakley's disappearance is still ongoing with the help of the FBI. But at this point, it is most likely that the little girl will not be found alive. Because of this, the focus is now on gathering enough evidence to bring forth charges against whoever is responsible. It is not impossible that her death may have been an accident. Andrew and Jordan clearly were irresponsible with their children's well-being, and Oakley may have accidentally ingested carelessly discarded meth or another substance and overdosed. However, Jamie Jo isn't convinced by that theory. In that case, why would they not confess and lead the investigators to her body so that they could be cleared of murder by an autopsy? And I'm inclined to agree. But this fight isn't over. Not by a long shot. You can do your bit to help Oakley by sharing her story and her flyers available in English and Spanish on the Justice for Oakley website. You can also donate to the Reward Fund and voice your opinion to the Washington DCYF Secretary Ross Hunter at ross.hunter at dcyf.wa.gov. We'll include a link in the show notes. And last but not least, you can join the Facebook group, Oakley Carlson, Oakville, Washington and ask your favorite news channel to cover Oakley's story. The links will all be available in the show notes. Investigators hope to speak to anyone who may have seen Oakley in 2021. The last credible sighting of Oakley was on February 10, 2021. Investigators have yet to find any evidence that Oakley was alive after the fire displaced the family on November 6. They want to fill in the gaps between those two dates. Anyone with information is asked to call Detective Sergeant Paul Logan 
at 360-964-1729 or by email at sodetectives at co.grays-harbor.wa.us or call Crime Stoppers at 800-222-8477. As a reminder, Oakley Carlson has been missing since February 10, 2021. When she was last seen, she was four years old, standing three feet tall and weighing 50 pounds. She has brown eyes and brown hair. She turns seven years old this week on December 6th. There is currently an $85,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of that beautiful little girl. I want to end this episode by reading a portion of a letter Jamie Jo wrote to Oakley. I know that I didn't give birth to you, but I wish I did. You were everything I'd ever dreamed of having in a child. Daddy and I wished and waited so long for a baby, and even though you came to us in an unconventional way, I loved you like you were my own biological child. I loved when strangers would tell us that we had the same smile, because it meant that people thought I could have even an ounce of your beauty. I will never forgive myself for not protecting you more when you went back to your biological parents. I thought I was doing everything by calling CPS and making reports to DCYF, but it didn't save you, and for that, I am so sorry. If I could mail this letter to you, I'd want you to know that you're making waves and that so many people are taking action. People in our little town, our state, and around the world know who you are and are thinking of you, praying for you, and doing everything in their power to make sure you're found and that this doesn't happen again. I knew that you'd be influential someday. I just wish it wasn't breaking our hearts in the process. Thank you for loving us, and I promise you that we will do everything we can to bring you justice and protect your siblings. Love, your mama. The haunting reality lingers as we draw the curtains on Oakley's story. The disappearance of a child is an indescribable tragedy, and Oakley's case, intertwined with my own fears as a parent, resonates deeply. The echoes of her face remind us that countless children face uncertain fates. Let Oakley's tale serve as a poignant reminder. Beyond the headlines and timelines, real lives hang in the balance. As we navigate through our own worlds, let us not forget the Oakleys who await a safe return. Awareness is the first step, and your listening ears matter. I implore you to carry this somber reflection forward. Share Oakley's story. Amplify the voices of those who advocate for the missing and stand in solidarity with families yearning for answers. Let us not allow these young lives to fade into the shadows of our collective memory. Thank you for joining me on this emotional journey. Until next time, may our hearts remain open to the stories that deserve to be heard. Okay, listeners, thank you for joining me in this episode as we file away another true crime case. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It's a really big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at True Crime underscore Cases, Facebook at Facebook.com slash True Crime Cases W Laney, and Instagram at True Crime Cases with Laney. Our website is True Crime Cases Podcast.com, and you can follow me on Instagram at Laney Hobbs BO or on TikTok at Laney Hobbs. And we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched, written, and edited by Jesse Hawk of The Inky Paw Print, with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks, at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at theinkypawprint.com. <laughs>